was the man we've come to pay respects to tonight, Tony Bell. Um, I'm going to speak later about my personal relationships with Tony as are some of my colleagues from inside and outside this house. But I'm going to first ask a very good friend of mine, a very good friend of Tony's, Lord Arthur Dobbs, who has to go up and do his democratic bid soon and vote to um, support the standardised pattern of battle regulations. You got it. So Okay. Okay. So, thank you very much indeed for arranging this. You've caught me at a Vanity Labour Party fundraising event and said you had this meeting, would I want to come along? And I ask Aidan, thank you for asking me. I'm just going to speak very briefly because any minute I've got to rush away and vote. Um, I, I've known, I knew Tony on and off for quite a number of years. Uh, I remember when I, was, when I was, before I was in the Commons, I was just a party member and I, I was given I had an argument with him the first time about something very very small. Um, I was giving him a, I'd asked to give him a lift back. I was on the few people in the Paddington Labour Party who had a car. So would I give him a would I give him a lift after after a party meeting? So I said fine. So I gave him a lift and I said, hey, seatbelt. And he looked at me and I said, nobody in my car goes without a seatbelt. And I made him put a seatbelt on. And he, he did it dutifully. And he was very interesting. He told me some interesting things about this was at the time of Barbara Carson and the place of strife. And he told me some very interesting things about, uh, about what was going on there. And he was very frank and open. But then I got to know him better when, when I was fortunate enough to be elected for, uh, for Battersea South and then Battersea the House of Commons. And of course, Tony was a very key figure in the party all the years of, all the years that I've known him. He was a controversial figure. He was controversial in people had arguments. But there was something about him which was very compelling. And very compelling when he spoke, his analysis, he was a brilliant speaker, and he had a sense of what the Labour Party and the Labour movement was about. And that was pretty terrific and inspiring, even if all of us at times had our disagreements with him. Because he was a key figure, and he was a very important figure. And he was utterly committed and dedicated. I went to Tall Puddle about two years ago, um, you know, the big Canadian demo. And I hadn't been to Tall Puddle before, uh, and, I, and they moving. But what was most moving of all, all was, it was the day after the Durham Miners Gala. <coughs> and Tony had been to Durham, and then he came straight down to take part in Tall Puddle. And he was getting on, and he was frail, and he was sat there, and I sat next to him and chatted to him. But what a person to show that level of commitment. You know, he wasn't physically well, he died not long afterwards. He wasn't physically well, but he went up to Durham to that very important event in, in, in the socialist calendar, and, and it's very important for the miners. <coughs> On his behalf, he fought very hard for many years, as, ha as had a lot of us. Uh, but he went there, and they came to Salt Puddle for this big day when the trade unions were there, there in force. And I thought to myself, this man is pretty terrific. What a level of commitment. And so I knew he wasn't well. I knew he, was, he wasn't going to last long. And I was, I was um, at his funeral. And his funeral was quite a, those of you who were there, it was quite an event because outside the funeral, it was like a Labour Party event. The, the miners were there and the people were there for the, for, the fringe, for the fringe event. And it just showed what respect people had. They came all the way to London from the northeast in order to demonstrate <coughs> their support for the work he'd done in his political life. And that was pretty terrific and I thought pretty humbling. And normally, you know, funerals are sort of, well, funerals are okay, I suppose. <coughs> But there were happy occasions, but there was something <coughs> really special about his funeral. I was lucky enough to be in, in, in St. Margaret's, uh, and, and there was a knowledge of people outside as well. And there was something special about the way in which people talked about him, the way in which people remembered him, and the enormous respect and commitment that, that he'd earned from so many people, such a variety of individuals and organizations. So I, I, was, I was pretty, pretty, pretty impressed by it. I have just one or two quick memories. Uh, I have. Um, I remember when we had the Falk when the Falklands War was on. Now, look, some of us thought the Falklands War was a nonsense, and indeed, uh, a small group of us voted against the, 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 the Thatcher government on the, on the Falklands War, and he was one of them. And I remember we used to sit and chat about these things and talk about what it meant and what we could do. So I have many memories of Tony, but he was a very inspiring figure, and without him, the Labour movement is a poor place. Without him, the labor movement hasn't got the base that it used to have. I, of 
Of course, it's easy to say at my age, you know, people aren't like Tony anymore. We don't, they don't make him like that anymore. Well, of course they do. But nevertheless, he was an inspiration. And at his best, he was one of the persons who inspired me the most. And at one time, I thought he was destined to be leader of the party. Well, we could analyze why that didn't happen. But uh, I was very privileged to know him. I was very privileged to, I, I was a friend of his. And I was very privileged to be able to be in Parliament with him and to be able to support him on many of his campaigns and ventures. So as I say, the world, the Labour Party, is a poor place without him. Thank you very much, Bob, and uh, appreciate you being here late, sitting on your monitor. Can I, um, I want to start, start talking about Tony. I want to say some bad things about him. Because as a 13-year-old boy, I hear that Tony, uh, Tony Blair, uh, huh? I hear that Tony Ben because he was the man who sunk pirate radio in this country. And then I'll go around this room try and find anybody old enough to remember pirate radio. And Tony was very, very clear at the time it was because commercial organisations were broadcasting from offshore and basically they were undermining the BBC. And Tony Ben, the man he was, and he was at the time, he was Secretary of State, if that was a proper title. I think it was Postmaster General actually that actually brought in the Marine Defences Bill on the 15th of August 1967. It gets burned inside my mind as <laughs> a real big fan. But what made it even worse, on the 30th of September 1967, we had the birth of Radio One, and that brought Tony Blackburn to the world. So, you know, one TB to the TB. If Tony Ben has any other in his life, is to give the world Tony Blackburn a platform. But apart from that, I've got nothing more good to say about the man. Um, as a former dirt miner, I read with the words that I've said. From 1962 onwards, he was a regular guest at the dirt miners. Got a huge gathering of, at times, quarter million people gathered together to stand up for what they believed in, to stand up for the right to work, the right to have a decent standard living, the right to be able to bring your people and family up in peace and security. Things that Tony was dedicated to him. And every time he came back to Gala, everybody went away feeling better about themselves because he made people believe that we can create a better world. And it isn't just about what family were born into, as he proved very, very clearly, how much money you had, what your status was in life. He believed we were all equal and we're all as good as each other and nobody was better than anybody else. He did tremendous things on behalf of the miners. In 1975, the last time this country actually had an energy plan, Tony Blair wrote it, which is called a plan for coal. And then visited the country, burning totally million tons of coal. But classically, even that long ago, burning coal cleanly. He developed with the National Coal Board um, processes which built laboratories, built places in Yorkshire and in North Wales that actually developed clean coal, coal technology long before the rest of the world. And sadly, as people will know, with the demise of the coal industry, following the 1979 election. Not only did we destroy the coal industry as it was, we also destroyed any semblance of developing clean coal technology in this company, which has been the detriment not just of this company, but of the world. And it's sad that um, we face that. I first met Tony personally in 1984, when as a coal miner on strike, I came down to London in the November of that year to try and raise money. We've been on strike since the March, and the truth was that nearly every doorstep, every place in London was already covered by miners from the rest of the country. So we were doing very well in collecting money. What we did do, we got invited to go and speak on a platform. And we were in the friend's house, um, which I'm sure is on your store. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm there as a relatively young man, just giving my experience, that's the support. And Tony got up next. And some people from the Revolutionary Communist Party start to seal them and see how dare you be on that platform with a miner when you close certain number of mines, etc. etc. Typical of some people left in this country. If we don't attack each other, we're not happy. Mm -hmm. And I got up and said, hang on a minute, you know, if we're going to start attacking Tony, Tony Ben, we might as well go up and go home because to me, Tony Ben epitomised somebody who can always rely to stand up with you and, and uh, be a comrade. I spoke about uh, Tony going from Durham to Tolpole. I'd actually been with him the day before, 
And Sandy, Tony took ill. He was at the dinner the night before he took over the dinner. And actually, during the day in Durham, he was in his bedroom, the first time he had been on the platform for almost 50 years, because even when he wasn't speaking, he still came as a guest to Durham. That's how committee was. And um, it was sad to see such a fantastic human being at the end of his life, like the rest of us, brought down by the feelings of, of humanity. But he was still there, and his spirit it was there then, and it'll be there as long as the Durham Lions come together, and as long as working people stay together. And the thing that I always will remember about Tony Benn, Unlike the politicians of today who are managerial and technocratic, but whenever they face a problem, it's like, oh, how will we get around this? His belief was, remember why we're doing this. We're doing this because it's the right thing. We're doing it because it's morally right. We're doing this because we're doing it for people who can't stand up for themselves. We're doing it for people of the world. We're doing it for the human race. He had a vision that sadly is lacking in politics of the day. And unless we get back to a scenario where people give, particularly those people who are at the bottom of, of society, unless we give those people a vision, people will continue being disengaged for politics. And we just keep telling people how hard it's going to be and how badly we're going to treat you, then people will turn off from us. And one thing I always remember, and speak with me to the other day, is hearing Tony Ben talk about education. And he saw education is the key to people on a better life. And he said, education should be free for everybody at any level, whether you're six or 96. And he included university education. And he said, what's wrong with going to education? Just to enjoy it, to learn things, to sit down with them, whether it's history, geography, media, anything in the world. If you're getting enjoyment out of it and enlightening your life, isn't that something worthwhile doing? And for me, that spoke volumes about the man. Because you know the truth in the world we live in now. Everything has to have a price. It's how much will it cost to set up Kippy University, how much the free school cost to settle, how much the academies cost. Everything is pounds and pence. And for Tony, what was more important than the price of things was the value of things. And for me, Alfie is right. We are poorer from from not being here, Alfie, we are sad. He was on conscience. He was certainly the part of his conscience, I think. That's one of the reasons why some people actually acted, acted against him to stop him getting a, a leadership position because his conscience just picked people and some people didn't like that. But there's a truth, politicians need the conscience to once in a while and Tony Benn was the one part of his doing that. So I'm delighted to stand here tonight. It was a sad time last March when lost Tony. We lost Bob Crow, another great trade union leader, sadly 30 years younger than Tony. And for my part of the world, we lost a great comrade called Stan Pierce, and most people won't have heard of. He was a man about the same age as Tony. He was the youngest man at his colony in 1947, when the day that the mines were nationalised, and he got the job of put the flag on top of the gold mine and saying, this still belongs to the people. And it's people like that that Tony Benn devoted his life to, when he could have lived the life of the land and gentry, and not cared about anybody he could have wandered off from coming here and preserving on every once in a while and claim his money and does nothing. He turned his back on that. And he did it for people who haven't got power to for themselves. A hero in every sense of the word. I will call me a Tony Ben. Thank you. I'm now um, delighted to introduce my colleague from the House of Commons, Katie Clark, who we worked together in the trade on Yonson for a number of years. Um, Katie is the Member of Parliament for our Trust and Aaron, is that right? By the North Ashes, But it's much, much more important. She was just recently elected as Secretary of the Trade Union Group of FPs in this building. Um, great comrade, great friend, Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve. And I knew Tony Ben from afar for many, many years. I, I'm someone really that's been involved in the labour movement since I was at school. I came from an area that was affected by the mine closures of 1984 and 1985. Um, I attended trade union and labour events where Tony Benn was one, always one of the, the main speakers. And of course he used to come to Scotland regularly. Um, so at events there also I would see him speak. And of course he's a man of great style. 
He was a, a man of great charisma, but he was also a man who spoke a language that really almost everybody could relate to. And I think that was his power. He put very complex and difficult ideas into simple language. And he inspired. He made people believe that it was possible to change the world. He made people believe that they were important and what they believed in was something that was worth struggling for. And I think that's why he's held with such affection by so many people in this country. I knew Tony Benn from afar, I probably met him very, very briefly, maybe on one or two occasions. I got to know him a little bit better when I arrived here in 2005. Um, he was no longer an MP at that time, as, as he said, he was um, he'd retired to get more involved in politics. Um, but he still attended the campaign group um, of Labour MPs almost every week um, at that time. The Socialist campaign group of Labour MPs used to meet every Wednesday in room W1 at half past five. Um, and Tony, like the rest of us, would be going to vote on this issue, which is an issue that I'm standing around here involved in, and John McCall was trying to talk out, I've got a wise role, um, and vote. Tony um, was very, very um, involved in the discussions at that time about what the Labour government was doing, what the Labour government should do, and what the Labour MPs should do in this place. And it was a massive pleasure to sit there with him um, for that hour every week to hear what he had to say. And Alan Simpson um, was also one of the people who was always um, in the room. So he's somebody that I remember with a massive amount um, of affection. I'm going to have to sort of draw my remarks to a close to what vote. Um, I don't think Tony would mind at all. Um, but it's a pleasure um, that I've had this opportunity uh, just to say a few words to him today. Thank you very much. Oh, that's wonderful. So you are here for well, some time. Uh, yes. Can I can I say a few words before I invite uh, my next speaker, Ellen uh, Simpson? Uh, I, I think to remember. I, I'm not here to do more. I'm here to celebrate the life of Tony Man because the great things he did in his life are very few people in this world who have done that. So I think let's celebrate his life, not mourn about his life, and continue with work he was doing. I think the best way to celebrate these people, and on my line, somebody sitting who's very close, friend of Sonok Charlie Bhutto, and we know that Bhutto was hanged uh, 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 40 years almost ago in 1979, but his legacy continued. And today in Pakistan is the second largest party or the first largest party. He will speak later on to tell us about it. Is the Pakistan People's Party which was left by Bhutto. So the best thing to remember the great people, the visionary people, the people who want to change this world is to continue with their philosophy, their commitment and their uh, 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 things they have started to do. I met Tony Benn in 1981 when I came to this country as a political refugee fighting against a manic Ziaul hack. I think we are facing his fruits even today in the world we live in. The things he started. And I know Sandra Satley has visited me in Pakistan many times to see personally how things have changed from a liberal progressive Pakistan to an extremist Pakistan. But now things are changing and I hope uh, they will change soon that we live in a peaceful world. But I came here as a refugee, as a trade union from trade unionist from Pakistan. I went to Tony Benn to support me in presenting the case of Pakistan International Airline Trade Union, which was banned by Ziaul Haq in 1981. And I went to him to support me and he said, Mushta, I will support you in ILO, International Labour Organization. I will support you in ITF, International Transport Federation, and he introduced me to that. And then he brought me into the parliament and look at me. I'm here <coughs> after 33 or 34 years in this parliament and I'm working on the same level. So I think the two events to remember him the best way is to do the things which he did. He raised the voice for the voiceless people. And there are people sitting in this audience from Hazara community, from Ethiopian community, from Palestinian community, from Pakistani community, and many other communities 
who are vices. Because in third world today, we know that in unipolar world, you are all rights have been stressed by the leaders of the world today, and they don't care about you, the people. They only care about what their economic and other interests are. So let's carry on that work which Tony Mann left last year on 14th of March and carry on with it as long as we live and transfer it to other young people who are sitting here uh, in the audience and among on the table that they can carry on it. I think we live in a very poor <coughs> world and we need to carry on. I think Tony Mann's main thing was to raise the voice of voiceless people, the vulnerable people, where, wherever they live, whether they live in Pakistan, India, Afghanistan or in uh, Palestine or Kashmir, he always praised the voice of it. Second thing, he always fought against war. He said the best way to deal with things is dialogue, strengthen the United Nations. He was very great supporter of non aligned movement, which is non existent today, but unfortunately, the leader of that non aligned movement uh, had gone. I hope with Aaron Simpson and Jeremy Corbyn, other people who are still committed to non aligned movement, we will have something to do with it. I think he always was for peace and justice. He was always against war. He said, if we have money to kill people, we must have money to feed the people in the world and make them healthy people. And I think that is the greatest thing uh, in, in Tony Benn's legacy. We should continue. I think uh, the pictures you are seeing on, on this screen are uh, in a meeting which Raja Fahed Sultan organized. He is reporting today for Jack and Geo, but he organized the World Labour Organization. And I give you one uh, small story and then I will invite Ellen. He went with me to that meeting. And let me give you another example of two events. One, I was approached by South Asian movement in Bradford. And they said, Tony, we are protecting him, but he is not available. And Tony always used to travel by train. He will never go by car. Uh, he said, I'm busy in Mushtaq. I can't go because I've got a meeting at 10 o'clock. He will wake up at 6 o'clock. He will sleep at 2 o'clock, wake up at 6 o'clock, and I know because I was living about 200 yards from him, and I used to visit him. He will call me at 8 o'clock. Can you wake up at 8 o'clock? I said, I'll come, and he will sit there with a cup of tea which without milk. So he will drink the tea without any milk. He was vegetarian as well. So I said, we have to go to Bradford. He said, OK, I will be at 10 o'clock. So if you come at 12 o'clock, we will go to Bradford. And can you bring me back by midnight? I said, definitely. So I asked my son to drive us to Bradford, his young man. So we drove him there. And on the way, we had a lot of meetings. So everybody wanted to meet him, whether it is in Nottingham, whether it is in Leeds, wherever. When we, I told a lot of Pakistanis that there are few Pakistanis still coming, your seat is here, Steve. Steve Ben is here. So do you mind, Steve, to come and join Alan Dub and Alan Simpson? Yes. There is a seat for you. So uh, uh, we, we traveled from here to Bradford, and then uh, uh, he spoke there, and we came back. It was the best 12 hours I spent with a great man. Uh, Steve Ben is the oldest son of Tony Ben who has joined us. Steve, welcome. So uh, I think on the way back, my son drove a little faster. And he was sitting at the back seat, I was sitting with him, and another man was sitting with us. He drove fast. But when we came in front of 12 Holland Park Avenue where he lived for many, many years, he came out and he shook hands with everybody and looked at my son and he said, was it F1 driver I'm traveling, traveling with him? So he simply criticized him for traveling fast but in a very diplomatic manner. And the second thing which he has mentioned about World Labour Organization, let me tell you, he went to that meeting with me. And all the speakers were speaking in Urdu. And he wrote it in his diaries 2001 to 2007. If you pick up the book, you will see Third World Solidarity and myself mentioned many times. And he wrote half page of it. He said, I was sitting in a meeting where the language I couldn't understand. But I was looking at Mushta and clapping when he was clapping, <laughs> laughing when he was laughing at this was the meeting which you are looking at. It. And then he said, then I was so lucky that somebody came who spoke in English and he put his poem, whole poem in that page and that is You and Me by Mahmoud Jamal, Jamal son, in which he 
uh, compared a terrorist and a general human being like you and me. It is on page 78 in his last diaries, 2001 to 2007, which was mentioned by Kathy Clark and others. I even love that he left the parliament saying that I want to do more politics. And he did more politics after 50 years as a parliamentarian from 1951 to 2001 and he retired by his last speech was I want to do more politics and he did more politics from 2001 to 2014 because I remember he used to attend at least 200 meetings, public speaking, every year since then and he, I used to meet him every year because I'm going to have uh, a minor's gala for the last 10 years as well and he was going there for the last 67 years he told me two years ago and I think remembering Tony Benn is the only way to carry on with the commitment and the vision he has left for us and that is the best way to remember him. Thank you very much. <laughs> Steve Benn has joined us who is the oldest son of Tony Benn and his daughter Emily Benn is fighting in crime itself. We uh, hope she will be ever a parliamentarian. Last year, your younger brother Hilary Bell spoke, and I hope you will say few words at some stage. But can I invite the godson of Tony Benn, Alan Simpson, farmer and thief from Britain, Alan Simpson? I'm not sure about godson, but it, it, <laughs> Tony, Tony was my mentor, my mind, uh, uh, my best mate, my best man throughout the entirety of my political life. Um, and I just want to reflect on what that meant and where I think that he would be urging us to look if he were sitting here today. I have to say that there's barely a day goes by when I don't feel I have some sort of conversation with him and where I don't miss him. Tony was the best leader that the Labour Party never had. And he never, we never had him, not because of anything about him, but because of the friends who left him. That uh, I have very little time for those who said, oh, you know, we were sabotaged by the gang of four, and then they left. Actually, it was the left that left, that <laughs> left us in bereft of his leadership of the party. But none of that slowed him down or deflected him at all. I and mean, it was that indefatigable optimism that I think that it's, you know, if we could bottle it and pass it around, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in now. Even on the, the last day of, of his life, he was propped up in bed, wearing a t-shirt that said, say no to the poll tax, 1381. And it seemed to symbolize so much about him. Here was someone who managed to be I'll give you the feeling that he was at an event over 500 years before he was born um, and was still part of the same struggle. And that was one of his overarching gifts. He could do this grand tour of the last thousand years describing events in which he felt he was probably present and bringing them together into a coherent theme that brought you to where we are now and what we needed to do next. And this was a communications gift that very few politicians have. Most of us have an incredible ability to bore people to death uh, and, uh, and dissipate excitement. Tony had an ability to harness it, bottle it, and pass it on. And he always did so by moving the goalposts. The first meeting that I can recall doing with him was at, at uh, Nottingham University. Um, and it was a year or so after the government had raised the school leaving age to 16. And the various points that came out of that university meeting and someone challenged him as to what he thought about the raising of the school leaving age. And he said, well, I'm actually, I'm in favor of raising it not to 16, but to 60. <laughs> because I think education should be a right to everyone throughout life. And he got barracked by this woman who suddenly stood up in a huge rage and she said, listen, Mr. Ben, I am 70 and I've just got my degree. Why should I be excluded? <laughs> <laughs> she said, right, you have to I'll move the goalposts right away. And he, that was the, his ability to move those goalposts. The other meeting that he did on education, which was not less devastating, was in his own constituency in, in Chesapeake, where there was a school meeting and uh, you know, he was on the platform and listening to 
the parents talking about the crisis of funding that they had and how they might address it and whether they should put up advertised hoardings on the front of the school on the main road or whether they should change what they sold in the, in the tuck shop or they should have uh, t-shirts with sponsorship from local companies and Tony sat there and listened and eventually the head turned to him and said well what do you, what do you think Mr. Ben, you listen to all these ideas, what do you think? And Tony said well have you thought about prostitution? And there was a silence in the hall and he said because I understand you Prostitution pays better than the price of a Mars bar, and crack cocaine is apparently even better still. You could be showing that in the tuck shop, and the looks of horror spread from the audience through to the head teacher, thinking, "Where on earth is going?" Then he turned to me, "You know, call me old-fashioned for that." We, she, I don't think we should be selling our children. Education should be a birthright. And it should be funded out of taxation. And a nation that is as rich as we are should be giving that education and funding it through taxation and not sending parents scurrying around trying to raise bits of money to make the education ends meet. And people just cheered because he gave them the blindingly obvious that we should not in a rich country, be setting the poor against each other in pursuit of the fragments of funding at the edges of that society. And my guess is he'd be saying exactly the same to us now. We're not far away from these exchanges that have been taking place, engineered by the military or whatever, calling for a 2% commitment of GDP to the defense budget. That's what will prop up NATO, that's what the US say we should be making commitment to. But Tony would, I, I think, have turned that around and said that, you know, the state of the insecurity in the world that we have is actually driven by defense funding. This uh, carnage across the Middle East was driven by the Blair, Bush, Mujahideen, and has turned the whole area and large parts of Africa as well into today's killing fields. And instead of a case for 2% of, of GDP going on defense, you really should be arguing 2% of GDP going into aid. Because for all the UK arguments about the burden of immigration in the UK, the global reality is that the vast majority, millions of those displaced persons around the planet are not being offered succor by the, the UK. They're being offered succor by their neighbors. We live in a world where, in the main, the poor are being looked after by the destitute. And that we need to, if we want to tackle that, it is food and aid and education and security that will bring about stability and, and and a degree of our own collective ability to live on a very fragile, an increasingly fragile planet. Now, some of the things that Tony would do as a friend in, in here, he would often come in and carry, be carrying a little polythene bag, no matter which shop it was from, but it was, it was clearly <coughs> was struggling, and he'd often call me and he'd say, if you've got a few moments, and I'd say, yeah, sure, of course I Whatever, what do you want? What, what do we, we need to talk about? So, you know, just have a little project. And we go off to some <coughs> uh, tucked away part of the past of Western Instant. Tony would open this bulking bag and bring out a black and decker drill and a set of drills and screws. And I'd say, what on earth is going on here? And he'd say, I've got a plaque here that we need to put on because, and it didn't matter what it was, the Chartists, the Suffragettes, any of the international struggles that had come from a popular base. And he said, you know, this place, it recognizes the great and the good, but not those who've done the greatest good. And I'm getting a bit too weak in the answer. So if I hold it back, could you do the drilling? So we'd be tucked away and I'd be thinking at some point the police and the security are going to come in as we drill these holes in the wall and then hurriedly put up a pack. And then three or four days later, there'd be a note from the sergeant and armed up saying, Brisbane, could you come and just talk about something has appeared in a wall in the closet here? Could we talk about it? And Tony would go there and I'd say, what are we doing? He said, just, just 
pain in the mound. Yeah? And, he, his, and then be told that this was not uh, allowed under the part of rules, and he just had to ask and tell me, see, I don't understand that. But you know, what they do is terribly important, and we don't recognize it adequately enough in this in the uh, And so he, he would offer an assurance, next time, next time, he would always come and ask first. And I'd come out and say, is, is, that, is that what we're doing? He said, no, 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 you never ask first. Always make a point of doing things, and then ask permission afterwards. That's the way to bring about change. And that's what he was brilliant at. He had this ability to come in and not just, I mean, we, most of us here would own up to loving the man, but actually the real achievement was that he was the only politician apart from Mandela that I've ever met who had the ability to get us to love ourselves. That to see within our reach an ability to transform the world. And the story when we we do around the story that he, I think, told most often in, in my company was about a, a, a village where a child falls down the well, and the villagers all come to try and get the, the child out, and then the, there's a voice that comes from the bottom of the well, and the child saying, I, I'm all right, lower a rope. So the villagers went, and they got ropes, and they lowered them down. One came to about 25 foot short, one 24, 15 foot, 10 foot, well, tantalizing me four or five foot beyond the child's reach, and the voice from the ch child from the bottom of the well shouted back up, Tie your ropes together. <laughs> and that was Tony's message to us. If we just have the sense to tie our ropes together, actually, we have the ability not only to rescue ourselves, but to transform society in ways that. Many of us could only dream of, but Tony actually lived the dream, was the embodiment of that dream. And that's what I think we need to do. And I think you're right, Mr. to say, this isn't about commemoration. The question for all of us is, what are we going to do about the legacy of Tony? And I, I think that we need, I thought we needed a fellowship of, of someone that, that actually was driven with a remit on annual fellowships that, that could be passed on, driving forward ideas. Then when I thought about it, actually one fellowship is not enough, we probably need five at any point in time to cover the reach of ideas that Tony ran with. And that's, I think, what he wants us to do now, to carry on running with those ideas, turning them into realities. Because if we do, I think that that's what that would be the biggest tribute that we could pay to him. An ability to, to actually take his ideas and turn them into tangible realities. Believing in ourselves and our, the fact that we really could change the world. And as I said in the Morning Star article I did on Saturday, actually it's not too late to prove him right. We just have to have the courage to do it and to put the resources, to pull the resources that we have into moving that into a shape that has an ongoing transformational legacy and not just an astounding one. Thank you very much, Alan. And I think, I think it, is, it is very important that we carry on with the task which Tony went through all his life. Uh, before I invite Stephen, we always welcome the people at the end to comment or uh, uh, ask questions from the speakers. Uh, but I want to welcome everybody from Third World Solidarity. Uh, Dr. Victoria Gurad is sitting at the end, Sandra Santali, Kefale is sitting here. And can I ask everybody who is around here to give uh, their emails to Kefale, who is sitting standing at the end, uh, that we can keep in touch with you in future events. And next, uh, I think Wednesday, we have a very important meeting in room 10, which we will be discussing human rights in Ethiopia. And you are most welcome to join us at 6 o'clock in room 10. But Kifali, you take the details from everybody. Now, I want to invite a very uh, different sort of person. We have heard from people who have met Tony many times, but maybe he has met once or twice. He was High Commissioner, I think longest serving High Commissioner in Britain, and he worked with many parliamentarians in UK, particularly from Labour Party when he passed, he got passed a resolution in Brighton conference, and I hope you both were there uh, to support him on Kashmir by the Labour Party. 
uh, Robin Cook was the, no, it was Jared Kaufman who was the Shadow Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs under Neil Kinnan. And he got, no, it was Tony Blair by then. I think Tony Blair was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he got it passed and he worked very closely with the Labour Party and including Tony Blair. Can I ask His Excellency <coughs> why the Chancellor doesn't Thank you very much, briefly? Thank you. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here with you this evening to remember great Tony Benn. As a matter of fact, when I was appointed High Commissioner by Benazir Bhutto, who was the first second time Prime Minister of Pakistan, and you usually know those normal briefings that ambassadors <coughs> get, I will went to her, and she gave me some names. And on top of those names were Tony Benn's name, he said, You must meet him since you are uh, inclined towards socialism, is the best person to teach you socialism. <laughs> well, that is what I did when I came here. One of my first meetings was with Tony Pan, and it lasted long. We had lunch together. And he was such a fatherly figure and such an inspiring person that uh, I have not found anybody second to him, anybody as good as him, or anybody who was as knowledgeable as him. Although I had the pleasure of uh, knowing Robert Cook, Robert Cook was also an excellent person and I would say one of the finest foreign ministers, foreign secretaries that the UK had in the recent past. Then others also, you know, Daddy Fetchett, he was also our minister, he was also very good. But Tony Benn was the person who was always there to guide us, you know, we were, uh, I was an outsider, I was not from foreign service like this young man here is. I was a journalist all my life, and as a journalist, I think Tony Benn took interest in me as well because he has been a uh, journalist himself, he has been writing, and uh, I have been very really fond of listening to him while writing. You know, I used to write to various places up country here and there where, because I have a very huge diaspora, and I used to have his cassettes in my car and listen to them, and they used to be so entertaining and enthralling and educative. Well, people like him are not only every day, uh, probably in centuries. At the best of you, I think, Lashari, you have done a great job, did wonderful, and uh, having a great in this function. We should always have, and we should have a rather, you know, not just making a few speeches here and there. We should always talk about what he did, and, you know, we must speak uh, some sort of in depth about the man, because that's how we have to remember him. Because that is how we are going to move forward. Because when I see uh, that composition of their party, including Pakistan, because our party, PVP, that, uh, that was in government at that time, is supposed to be a sister party, the Labour Party, and member of Socialist International. So we are all together. But I hardly see socialism anywhere. <laughs> all the political leaders, all the political members, all the various parties, maybe they have a. Uh, uh, different colors of feathers, they fly in the same direction. <laughs> Unfortunately, I must say this. And, uh, but I would, if we were to follow Tony Ben, we will have a sense of direction, we, we will have a commitment that we have to make this world equitable to everybody. We have to have equal distribution, equitable distribution of wealth, human rights, rights of poor, rights of various minorities. But less privileged communities. That is what Tony Ben stood for, and that is what he lived for. And that is where the great lies that the man lived and died for the cause that he has always been dear to him. With these words, I thank you once again for having invited me here to Tashari and giving me a chance to speak about a great man who we will all remember always. Thank you. Can I now invite uh, Steve? I met you last time at uh, uh, flat 11, 12, Bedroom Trails, is it right? Where he was living for his last days. And Steve uh, was running around to find out. Tony was one of those people who wanted to be independent up to the last days. And he went to cash machine, and I think he lost his uh, car into machine because he uh, went to the hospital first. He was uh, in the hospital and he was a great supporter of NHS all the times and, and Steve was trying to sort out and he, he was not feeling very happy that somebody else has to sort out something. So can I uh, say that he lived 
very independent life. He will walk around. He will travel by public transport in last day. Once I ask him, because his second son, Hilary Ben, who is now Shadow Secretary of State for Defense at OOD in 2005, Sandra, if I'm right, to say in the other side of the room, approved under third world solidarity or party parliamentary group, that we, the Britain, is one of the richest nations and we must do 0.7% of our GDP for A, which Ellen and a lot of people have mentioned that we should do more. And he uh, did it during his period because we were at that time 0.2%. And he rapid our fast track it and we should do it under the Labour Party. But we couldn't by 2010. I think it was achieved by 2013. And we have to stress, because I think now the government is thinking to reduce it or discuss it at least. I think it is great to have people who live in a more uh, developed world, but always think about the people who are living in a very poor, difficult circumstances. Can I invite Stephen Ben to speak uh, 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 for whatever experience? Obviously, you have lived for a very long time as a son, <laughs> but then I'll uh, speak very long time. <laughs> long time. Steve Ben. Thank you very much. And the first thing I do want to say on behalf of the family, of whom I am a representative here tonight, is to say thank you for having put this meeting on and to do it in his honour. It's very kind of you. I'm afraid I don't speak Urdu, so those of you who, who do and don't speak English won't understand a word of what I'm about to say. But um, I'm very grateful and I'm glad to be able to be here. Um, and it's very nice to hear what you said about him. I missed what I've had to say, but it's very nice indeed to hear what the others have said so far. I won't, it's all right with you, Alan, attempt to impersonate him. Uh, you'll have to battle it out with the speaker, who yes. is well known for doing a very good line in impersonation. Um, but I must admit, when I look at the uh, photographs that are on the screens, it's lovely for me to see him. You can tell that it was taken at least six months before he died because he sort of gave up shaving in August. Uh, and so the last few months of his life, he had a beard. He did once have a beard in 1969 when he was a minister. And he shaved it off in the middle of a ministerial visit to what was then Yugoslavia. And it caused a lot of consternation. They were all expecting a bearded minister to get off the plane. And, and he didn't. It was, uh, it was a clean shave. And I was just sitting here thinking about what, if anything, I could say that might be useful today. And of course, he was the youngest member when he went through the door just over there in 1950. And, and yet, by the time he arrived here, albeit as a very young member, he had had some real experience. And I mention it because I think it did radicalize him when he was young. He learned to fly in what was then called Rhodesia in the 1940s. His other brother, my uncle, was a fighter pilot. And he learned to fly, and he had his first taste of what was life in, you know, Southern Africa at the time, and the way people were treated, and I think you can read about that in his diaries too. And I think that was his first hint of radicalization, as well as the election campaign in 1945. And in the 1950s, he was a very strong supporter of the movement for colonial freedom. And when I was very young, we got to know the names of some of the people who were regarded, if I may say so, as uh, by many people here as terrorists, because they were and soon emerged as the leaders of their own independent countries. I'm thinking, for example, of Strelzi Carver, many you may know, who lived in London and lived in Princeton, and who was a frequent visitor to our house, and we got to know him very well, and he became the godfather of my sister. So there was a very close connection, and he was a strong supporter as a sort of radical. He wasn't the person that you got to know later in his political life, but he did, like everybody, go on the journey. And in the 1950s, that was his journey. In the 1960s, uh, he had his own experience that personally radicalized him, uh, trying to remain as a member of parliament. And then later, we're in the Wilson room at the moment, named after the Prime Minister Aaron Wilson, who appointed him to government in the 60s and 70s, and he learned a great deal, and always said he learned a great deal from experience, including his experience as a minister. And I think it's also true that it's, it's sort of appropriate that his very last appearance in Parliament 
which was over there in Westminster Hall in December 2013, his very last speech, as well as his last appearance in the palace, was at the meeting to commemorate Nelson Mandela. Um, and we had gone as children with him and the family on anti-apartheid demonstrations in the 60s, and there he was speaking with others. But I must admit, if you look at it, because it's all on YouTube, his speech was very short, and he simply said that what he always remembered Nelson Mandela for was for the anger of inju against injustice and the hope that of a better world if you fight for it and tie your ropes together. Uh, and the other thing I would leave you with is something that I'm sure you all know very well. And he took every opportunity to say it, especially to younger people when he was speaking, which he did do a great deal of. He did leave the house to spend more time on politics, and that's exactly what he did. And he mentioned the school leaving age. Um, the Open University presented him with a posthumous doctorate in September, which is very nice, and I went along to receive on his behalf. And I made a point of saying that he was in favor of a school leaving age, not only up to 65, but 95. <laughs> and blow me down, I didn't discover that the oldest graduate of the Open University is older than <laughs> So he would have liked that very much. But now the thing I will leave you with are the five questions he used to put. I'm sure you know them, but they're well worth repeating. And these are questions you should put to people who have power, wherever and whenever you need them. First of all, what power have you got? Secondly, where did you get it from? Thirdly, in whose interests do you exercise it? Fourthly, to whom are you accountable? And fifth, how do we get it? And I mention that in particular because they're very easy questions. We are, after all, coming up to general election. And if there's one merit in the general election, without being too politically partisan, you can get rid of people who like that thing, and I leave them to the electorate. But thank you very much for organizing this meeting and for remembering him. And I hope that he will be remembered for many years to come. And uh, it will be a pleasure on every occasion to listen to the impersonation of <laughs> no, but thank you very much. And on behalf of myself and all my family, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you, I, uh, Al Farah is here from Constantine Delegation or OK folks. We're going to open up for um, short questions and answers, comments, anybody wants to make any uh, input. Question answer. Sandra, just give me a No, I, I don't really have a question. Just what do you want? Uh, my name is Sandra Safley. I'm a journalist, but I'm also a founding member of Pyramid Solidarity. Over the years, Tony Benn uh, um, was, um, still is in spirit, um, instrumental in informing what Pyramid Solidarity does. Um, Tony Benn was a mentor of Mushtaq Bashari, when Mushtaq Bashari first came to this country, as been aforementioned. Um, we've had so many meetings over the years with Tony Benn at his house. I've interviewed him as a journalist. Um, he's inspired, as everyone has indicated tonight, um, all people that listen. And I think the voice <coughs> is still there. Um, I, I thank Tony Benn's son, who's here tonight, that I've not had the opportunity who might not have the opportunity to meet before. But I thank everyone who's spoken because um, from, from the um, Durham Miners meetings that I've been to myself, along with Professor Victoria Goddard, um, where Tony Benn has always been there, to so many demonstrations that I have gone to the front and walked along with Tony to his legacy today in this meeting. I'd just like to thank everyone who's here who, who supports him and the voice that I think will remain with us and should do to inspire our future forever. Thank you. I, I, one of my blessings in life is to meet Tony Blair. Don't do it, man, Tony, don't man. Because I used to send emails to him. And uh, he was very kind to me indeed. 
and uh, he I thought, why can I go in? I said in my subject line, female, Saint Bell, remember again, that was my subject line of email to him. And they, I am not the only one calling him Saint, because as you may know, many people call him Robert Ben. So he, he, I was not unusual, but I did call him Saint Ben. And secondly, I, I became victim of a supplement uh, promotion, and I was uh, bypassed by somebody who was less qualified for promotion. And Tony Ben, lovely man he was, he wrote a letter to the vice chancellor. And I can tell you this one thing, the man had humanity and compassion in him and he uh, said that this blind person, Dr. Major, we all respect him, why don't you please don't treat him unfairly and promote him. And his letter of support was quoted with the people and 13 people wrote in my support and the job is done. Now I have, a, I have an office in the university until I retire. And that was the settlement brought about by Tony Ban. And last time I met him was on uh, 20 July 2010 and he said to me this. He said, I'm here. I know you, you used to walk around on your own fast and actually well and what's the problem? You have problem of mobility now. And he said, and that is the measure of the man, he said, I don't like that. Please take care of yourself. And that was the last meeting that senior man. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. I would just, uh, just like to remind people and, and to acknowledge now to the family and to everyone gathered here, Tony's tremendous contribution to everything. But what I want to specifically mention is, is the, the number of times you turned up on a cold January day at the very end day. Um, bloody Sunday parades and protests definitely helped us to get the inquiry which we ultimately got, which went on for the best part of all for around 40 years. It was absolutely appreciated. It meant an awful lot to us that someone of his status, of his stature, of his integrity should lend, lend his support to us over the decades. And it meant an awful lot. And I want to say a profound thank you from myself and all the other Irish people in the world. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Tariq Rashid, the Labour Party fundraising officer for Brent Central CIP, London Borough of Brent. Thank you very much, Mushtaq Saab, to invite me to attend the post Tony Ben anniversary. I feel honoured to say a few words about the Labour Party great parliamentarian Tony Ben. As my very little knowledge, and all of you know that as well, Tony Benn was born in London on 3rd April 1925. Since first time he won by-election on 30 November 1950 to till his death, the age of 88, Tony Benn served the Labour Party principally and passionately. We will never forget the Tony Benn in our British politics. I have my best heart condolence for Tony Benn. Thank you. Thank you very much, myself, Nafat Ali Hazara from the Zara United Movement, a small campaigning group in the UK, uh, trying to persuade all, uh, actually, a faction uh, for stopping persecution of the Zara in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Well, I, one thing I have noticed coming up, obviously, in this uh, conference, and that is the protector and promoter of human rights. Uh, Mr. Tony Ben actually 
at the Kyudos Shukor to Mr. Mushtaq Nashari and his team, the APPG, for organizing such a conference. The only thing I can see in this, uh, obviously, part of the world is the people of all colors, all faith, all creed, and all cultural background can get together to pay tribute or tremendous tribute to somebody who has at least done something for the protection of human rights. On the contrary, we can see the people in some other parts of the world which are more volatile that the human rights activists actually, if you can try or dare holding such a conference in their favor or to pay any tribute to them, at least this is not possible. For different reasons, the non-actor, uh, the non-state uh, actors actually could also target them as well as the uh, intelligence agencies and the establishment in those worlds. So, I should say that me, like other fellows here, uh, are very fortunate to pay tribute to somebody like Mr. Tony and, and I do hope that the promotion and protection of human rights and human values will uh, promote and go ahead or cherish in conferences like this one. Thank you very much. First of all, we are gathered here to pay tribute to Tony Ben, but I will have one question. Uh, before I ask you this question, I have to tell you a little bit of my own experience that uh, five and a half years ago, when I came here, I was a student of uh, politics and I joined law, and I used to meet Quinton Hawk and the government was uh, of conservative and uh, for a few years then I started listening to Tony Benz, his speeches and slowly and slowly I joined the party and then after that I went fully uh, 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 to listening to the Labour Party leaders. Tony Benz stood out as leader and he changed my life and he changed my thing all together. But with that act, then uh, uh, our uh, in Pakistan, uh, Dr. Khalid Bhutto uh, came on the scene. He became an international figure. The real man, sorry, Tony Ben, stands at which stage in the international level? That is, I always think of that. When I, I would like to ask you this question. Where does he stand in the international figures? I'm very, very clear he stands right at the highest level because he believed in nationalism and he believed in nationalism not for his own personal or political um, well being. He believed in it as it was part of his soul. He believed in it as a humanitarian and as a, as a member of the human race and he lived his life that way. And he didn't do it for political, military or other reasons he did it because he passionately believed in the rights of humankind and the needs of humankind and we do a lot more people like him. Thank you. I just want to add to the five democratic questions that uh, Terry mentioned that um, we can't uh, if you speak with please. So, if you, uh, the, um, first of all, what power have you got? Where did you get it from? And, um, and uh, who to whom are you accountable? And uh, how can we get rid of you? And he also said, and if you can't get rid of powerful people, we don't live in a democracy. It's that simple. And I used to go to um, several of these meetings and uh, and he said, oh, uh, you're, you're, you, um, you're coming here again? I said, yes, I know I'm coming to see you. He said, you know, um, I often see you here, and, and if I come to a meeting and you're not here, I think I've gone to the wrong meeting. I really do. <laughs> so one of my uh, recollections of many, many of the time when I met him again at um, Toll Puddle. <coughs> I had my partner with me then, and um, I introduced him to 
And he said, uh, you know, he follows me everywhere. I don't know where, where, where he gets the energy from. I said, well, I'd actually, I go on to brick equipment do us all batteries. This is the thing to it. Well, thank you very much for my speech. Uh, I think there are two kinds of leaders. One, they do the work, and one, they get the applause. So Tony Ben was the one who was actually uh, feeling for the, uh, for the world, and he was doing the work for the civil society. But Tony Blair was politically successful, and he <laughs> ruled the military and the world. So uh, in my opinion, Tony Ben is better than Tony Blair. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I've just got a question for the panel. In light of the fact that Tony Benn left Parliament to do more politics, as people have said, um, is there any saving of the Labour Party? Um, there's lots of people now, particularly young people, um, moving to the Green Party. Um, I myself, after Iraq and Afghanistan, still could not vote for the Labour Party. Um, until those people are in a war crime struggle or in the Hague. Is there any saving of the Labour Party or do we move elsewhere? Um, I also left Parliament um, to spend more time on politics, um, but I refused to leave the Labour Party. I mean, Tony, I you used to have lots of conversations about precisely this, and Tony said, look, you know, if, if, if you strip it to its worst, lowest level, the reality is this, it always upsets them more if you stay than if you go. And that's true. The, it, the, the history of the Labour Party and the Labour movement in, in this country is often littered with its own tragedies. One of the other things Tony could say is that Almost, you know, the problems for Labour is the theological obsession that if two or more are gathered together in my name, it's obviously time for a split. And it's our disunity, our willingness to detach ourselves from each other, that is our enduring source of weakness. So, you know, I, I was the chair, national chair of Labour Against the War for about a decade, uh, and for all the horrendous things that the Labour government did and the way which Labour MPs were manipulated and deceived by a leader of Australia, Walker, uh, and was to try and search. That is not a case for leaving the Labour Party. It's a case for getting shut at those who lead us into war, not walking away. And the reality of British politics is that I would love it if the Greens could transform the Labour Party. They're not going to be decisive players in the formation of the next government. And so I would always say that you know, Labour was at its strongest and most radical when radical movements came into the Labour Party rather than left it. And that they themselves, each of those movements, worked out how to form alliances within the party to change the direction of the party. And that's still my profound belief and the reason why I refuse to leave. But that doesn't make the Labour Party a desirable entity. It is pitifully unambitious in where we are now. Pitifully. Does it measure up to the challenges that face us in the next decade that will determine the whole shape of the planet? No, it does not. But if we're going to construct or reconstruct a party that is fit to make those challenges, You've got to be in the ring, peeing out, rather than outside of the PA. My, my background is trade unions. So I would argue that a lot of my comrades in the trade union government have done exactly what you did because of um, some of the things that happened in the last 20 years. And all we've done is make us weaker and then other people <laughs> who are destroying this country take control. If there'd been a strong left, United Party, the people who get behind, perhaps that would have been great, but sure that there isn't. As long as we keep walking away, or some people keep walking away, it just means more chance 
all the people being there. Yeah, and that's just people all the time. It's the oldest story in the book. You've got to organise it. And if you, if, you, if you look part of it, you can't organise it. So if we get people who are MPs, councillors, etc., like people in the Labour Party whose views aren't like most people in this room, but we're not in there trying to, try to take them out, then unfortunately they'll keep on coming in. Lydia? Uh, yes, thanks. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, 50 years. And short remembering, but I remember I'm the luckiest one to drive uh, Tony Benn from some conference 40 years ago. And I drive, and he was sitting on the first seat on the front. And when I was driving to take him home, if you all remember somebody, maybe Mustaq Lashari remember, Abdul Amir Ghazi. He was told me to, you going home, take Tony Blair with you, you know. And I was very uh, lucky man, the way to choose me to take him and drop him at home. When I opened the car, front seat he was sitting, uh, Charles remembered and he said to me, which of, part of world you came in, in England? And I said to him, I came in, Great Britain about five years ago, and uh, I said, I'm originally from Mongolia, my back, my, uh, my back, back east, I said, from Mongolia, and uh, you were said from Mongolia, I said, yes. He said, it doesn't look like real Mongolia. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very great man, and I said, no, I'm the race of Chinggis Khan. 
Uh, originally, we live in Afghanistan, in Iran, and Russia. So we living on Balochistan and Koita Balochistan. He said Koita, I know, is a headquarter was uh, for the British Army on ruling time. Koita Balochistan. They call it Stop Calling. He remember he was so fast, you know. And I said, yes, Stop Calling is still in Koita. And he was very happy. He said, I, he said uh, like you said, you came in great Britain. He said, we are great. First time I see some Mongolian from Chinese race, you know, in, in England, he said. He said he's, he's very happy, he was very happy for that. And he said, I'm very great, you know, to Great Britain bring every kind of community in England. And he said, I'm very happy to see the first Mongol from Chinese Khan race. And he was very happy. And this shot remember it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Can I thank David Larson, who has been a great chairman of the Red Cross since he took over as MP in 2005. I hope he will continue after 7th of May because uh, we are expecting him to be elected from Reading constituency. And Reading was a constituency where everybody started the Labour Party, if I remember right. Uh, yes. Can I thank all the media people, Asif Darsab? Uh, I think uh, uh, Mumir Rashid is there, Dunia TV, and there are many other people who are here from media, uh, Raja Sahab, Raja Fuzan, uh, and everybody else who has attended this meeting. I'm really thankful. But can I say that with the help of Vajit Samsarasan, who has met him as a high commissioner, we will do another meeting next year and much better. I want to start which I announced last year as well, a lecture on Tony, and I hope Steve and Evelyn and Kevin will support us. We want to do a lecture because I think the best way to remember someone is to invite a person who can give a lecture on them. I know that a lot of people have read and met Tony many times and they will continue as long as they live. But I think remembering somebody and shifting it to the next generation is always if you start a lecture on the present issue that we will do it next year on 14th of March. And Aaron, thank you for writing a big uh, uh, article in Morning Star Day before yesterday, which actually I think some people read and they are, they are in attendance here. I thank everybody, Leslie and these young two ladies are organizing a meeting of Kurdish. Am I right? Kurdish on the day after tomorrow in uh, at least Suite and anybody who want to join us, let, let's let meet them. I think you are friends speaking, so it's good to have people from France, Ethiopia, from I don't know which part of the world. So thank you. And particularly thank to Mustafa Rabani, who is representing Pakistan High Commission. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, good luck and have a safe journey and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.